All right, let's start out with a quick warm up. If a car goes a constant velocity of 20 miles per hour, make a quick ske sketch of the velocity versus time. Um, so on your own paper, go ahead and do that. Pause this for just a minute and make sure you can do it. Um, this is velocity and it says it's going 20. This will be in miles per hour or miles per hour. Sometimes we write, uh, and this is time in hours. And so a constant velocity of 20 miles per hour looks like this. Uh, so hopefully you felt good about that. How far does the car go between zero and five hours? How far does the car travel? Um, so hopefully you were able to find that if the car is going 20 miles per hour, 20 miles per hour times five hours, the hours cancel out and we get 100 miles. It goes 20 miles each hour. 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, over five hours, it goes 100 miles. And what represents that on the graph? Well, it goes 20 miles the first hour, it goes 20 miles again the second hour, the third hour, the fourth hour, the fifth hour. So what is it that represents it? Well, it's this area here. This area represents the 100 miles traveled. And this should make sense, right? This is five hours. So five hours times 20 miles per hour. And again, um, we'll see that the units cancel out hours and per hour cancel out and gives us just 100 miles. Um, so the area of a rate represents how much the thing that rate was measuring changes by. So, uh, you know, miles per hour over a certain number of hours, that area will represent how many miles the car traveled. If uh, a bathtub is filling up five cubic inches per second, um, then over a certain number of seconds, we can find out how many cubic inches total filled up. Um, but what we're going to get into, and this is like the major issue that calculus allows us to solve, isn't this like middle school type of questions like we've had up here, but um, Calculus is going to let us do very similar things to what we did in the first semester with rates. We knew how to find the slope of a straight line from Algebra 1. Calculus had nothing to do with that. We, we, we do the rise over the run, and uh, that would tell us the slope of a straight line. We started dealing with curves. What happens if something's curved? How do we find the, um, how do we find a, uh, the slope, the rate of change of a curved line? And now we're going to be looking at how do we find the area underneath curved lines. And what that will allow us to do is add up, you know, how much rates are changing by. And we'll actually be able to link these two together very nicely. Similar to what we did in the first semester, we're going to find an estimate. Today, we're going to work on finding estimates for slopes of curved lines. And we're going to do a limit next class to make that estimate like the exact right answer. So here is a car traveling uh, different velocities now. So we can't just make a rectangle and find how far it went. Um, but we want to ask, what does the integral uh, from 0 to 30 of v of t represent? Um, and, and I hope we understand that it represents the area under this graph. Um, but what does it represent in terms of the car? What is, what is this area? which we know the integral represents from last class. What does it mean in terms of the car? Well, this is how far the car traveled from t equals 0 to t equals 30. So how far did that car travel in this time period? Um, in those 30, hour, 30 minutes, I guess. It says it's minutes here, so this is in uh, minutes. Um, and this is feet per minute. How, how many feet did the car travel in 30 minutes? In feet. Um, okay, so we're going to estimate this. It's, it's not possible to find exactly how much this is based on the information given in this table. So we have like some data points, 0, 8. We have um, 5, so this must be counting by 5s, 15. Um, we have 10. 23, whatever. Okay. But we're going to estimate it using four uh, different methods. And our first method is going to be called the left Riemann sum. 
And um, this should make a lot of sense. Uh, it's the left Riemann sum. And so we're going to start from the left. And what we're going to do, our technique, is we're going to make rectangles. Um, so left Riemann sums are rectangles starting from the left. And so we start on the first point we have, which was at eight, right? And we go over until we have another data point. We just go straight over. And as soon as we have another data point, we're gonna end this rectangle. So we'll go straight down to the x-axis, this rectangle right here. Then we will go to the next data point, go straight down, that'll be the base of a new rectangle, and go over until we have a new data point. Here's a new data point. We'll end our rectangle there, go straight down. We'll have a new rectangle. Now this rectangle had a height given in the table. This is 5, 10. This height was at, at t equals 5. The height was 15. Um, and so on. So we can, we can drop a rectangle down, go over, make a new rectangle. And we can do this the whole way over, making new rectangles. Here's a new point. Go over, down, make a new rectangle. Go over, down, make a new rectangle. And you'll notice we're now at the end of our function and we have one more data point, but we don't need to use it. So we don't use the last point on the right when we're starting with the left Riemann sum. Okay, so let's estimate how much area is this? Well, these are rectangles and uh, rectangles uh, are length times width. So the length of this rectangle is however much we're going over by each time. So what is the change in x? And we'll see that here. Here, the change in x is 5. 5. And we can see it on the graph here, that it's going over by 5. Going from 5 to 10 is also 5, 5. Um, and so the height of each rectangle will be whatever that data point is. So this area of this rectangle is 8 times 5. Plus, we need to add in the area of this rectangle. This rectangle has a height of 15. And it's multiplying by the width of this rectangle, which is 5. Um, these, using this table, uh, let me see, I wish I had slightly more room here. I wish this table were, like, copied down. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to just write these here. This is 23. This was 32. This was 30. This was 24. And then this one is 27, the one that we didn't use. Okay, so I'll put those there. Um, what are the rest of these rectangles? Well, uh, we have 23 times 5, 32 times 5, 30 times 5, and 24 times 5. Um, it's fine to use a calculator and stuff like this. Uh, on the free response portion, you could just like leave your answer like this and this would be good enough. And if it's on the multiple choice portion, um, it's usually pretty easy. Um, another trick you can do is if it's all multiplying by the same thing, you can factor out the 5. So 8 plus 15 plus 23 plus 32 plus 30 plus 24. This is slightly higher. This is slightly more numbers than I would expect to have on the AP exam, but let's go ahead and see. So 23, 46, 66, 70, 100, 132. 132 times 5 uh, is... 660, I think. I don't know. Um, seems right to me. Let's actually do it. So 5 times 8 plus 15 plus 23 plus 32 plus 30 plus 24. I'm writing out the factored form where I factored out the 5 on the outside because it's a lot shorter. So this left Riemann sum came out to be 660. Now, is this the exact area? Is this how far the car traveled? This means the car traveled about 660 feet. But is that right? Well, no, we can see that there's like some parts that are missing, like there's some area. This was just an estimate. Um, in fact, there's some overestimates sometimes, you know, um, where we go over it. You know, this is too much and this is too little. And so there's some missing parts or some parts where we're overcounting. Um, so this isn't exactly right, but it's an estimate. Um, so the car traveled about 660 feet. Um, our next method, you might be able to guess, you might want to guess to yourself real quick, is going to be a right Riemann sum. It's also an appropriate estimate. And um, I bet you can guess how this one works. It will be, what shape do you think? It will be rectangles, just like before. 
Um, but this one will start from the right because it's a right Riemann sum. So we start with the rightmost data point and we drop a line straight down to make a rectangle. And just like before we go over, but now we're going you know, this way because this is the only way to go until we get to our next data point. And as soon as we get there, we're gonna end our rectangle and say, look, there's our first rectangle. Then we'll start again at our new data point. That's the beginning of this rectangle. And go over until we get to our next data point and drop down a rectangle. Go to here. Um, if you have these notes printed out, this is a good time to stop and make sure you can actually like draw this out from here on out. It's worth trying. Um, some people get confused a little bit here if they aren't trying it themselves. So drop it straight down, go over, drop it straight down. Here's a new one. We're going to drop it down, go over, drop it down. These are our rectangles and the rectangles will always touch the curve on their right side of the rectangle. So here's the right side of this rectangle. Go over, drop it down, go over, drop it down. And you'll notice that we don't use the leftmost data point. Uh, the, the point on the left, because there's no rectangle to make out of. Um, and this is a different estimate, but it's also an estimate of about how much area there is. Is it exact? Is it great? No, but it's, you know, it's an estimate. Um, so again, it's going to be the uh, lengths, 5 times the heights. Um, now this time they're different. This will be 15, 23, 32, 30, uh, 24 and 27. Notice um, we didn't use the 27 before, um, and we are now, and we used an 8 before, and we're not using this 8 at all. Like, that's not a thing. So 5 times 15 plus uh, 23 times 5. I don't know why I switched over where my 5 was. Let me just do 5 times. 15 plus 23 plus 32 plus 30 plus 24 plus 27. And so hopefully you were able to find this. Um, so it's going to be five times. You know what's funny is I'm just going to go up here and I'm going to copy this last one. I know I'm not using the eight now. And I know I'm adding in an extra 27. So I used all the other points for the same, right? So this has to be right. So this is 755. Um, five times 15, five times 23, five times 32. That's the area of each of these rectangles by doing length times width. Okay. The next one is called a midpoint. Riemann sum. And the way this one works is <clears throat> you skip the first one. You're also not going to use the last one. And you use every other one. So what it is is like, okay, we're going to use this one, and then we're going to skip the next one. And then we're going to use this one, and we're going to skip the next one. And then we're going to use this one, and we skip the last one. And the reason we're skipping every one other one is this is going to be the midpoint of a rectangle. We're going to go both left until we get to a data point and right when we get to a data point. And the nice thing about these midpoint Riemann sums is oftentimes it'll have a part that's like both um, an underestimate and an overestimate. Like this part is missing from the rectangle and this part is missing. And a lot of times they kind of help cancel each other out. Um, this one will go left and right until we get to those data points that we're not using. And this will be, you know, a, another rectangle. We go here and we go both left and right. And it becomes the midpoint of a rectangle. And so we're only using these heights. So we're not using eight. We are using 15. We're not using 23. We are using 32. We're not using 30. We are using 24 and we're not using 27. Uh, and so, this time, it's going to be 15 times, not 5, be careful, the length of this rectangle is now 10, right? Because um, what it looks like from the table directly is, so we skip this one, we use this one. We skip this one, we use this one. We skip this one, we use this one. But what's happening is it's this width, so 10 minus 0 is 10, so now it's plus 10, right? From 10 to 20, that's 10. From 20 to 30, that's 10. Um, and so we're using these midpoints of a rectangles that are twice as wide. So hopefully we feel okay about that. <clears throat> so 15 times 10 plus 32 times 10 plus 24 times 10. And again, they all have a plus 10 there. And so we can factor out the 10. 10 times 15 plus 32 plus 24. Um, so that's 39, 71, 71 times 10 is 710. 
So this gives us an estimate of about 710. Now, notice these are all just like estimates and they're fairly near each other. This one's saying like, hey, look, the car traveled about 710 uh, feet in 30 minutes. This one's saying the car traveled 660 feet in 30 minutes. This one's saying the car traveled 755 feet in about 30 seconds. But they're all just estimates because we don't actually know what's going on in the middle here. We, we only have data on certain points. <clears throat> so let's see. <clears throat> Our last one is going to be the most accurate estimate. It's called the trapezoid rule. And for this, we talked about it um, in our last class, I believe, you need to know the area of a trapezoid. So if you have a trapezoid with two parallel bases, base one and base two, and a height, what is the area of a trapezoid? Hopefully we know we take the average of the two bases and multiply it times the height. Um, so let's see how this works. Unlike the midpoint uh, one, we're going to use every point and we're going to connect them together and make a trapezoid. And I hope you notice, like, this is a really good estimate of the area. Like, did it leave very much out? It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. We're going to connect these two and make a trapezoid. We're going to connect these two and make a trapezoid. By dropping it straight down, we're going to connect these two and make a trapezoid. And I hope you can see like there's a little bit of area missing here, but this is a remarkably good estimate of um, the area. And if we were before calculus times, this might be like the kind of estimate we would use um, to try to get an accurate estimate, but we could do much better using calculus as we'll see next class. So let's see, okay, again, let's remember what these heights were. They were eight, 15, 23, 32, 30, 24, 27. I hope I'm remembering them right. Okay, um, so how does it work? Well, the height is this. The height is the distance from here to here. So it's going to be five times, and we need to average the two bases together. So we add 8 plus 15, and we divide by 2. That averages them together. That's the area of this trapezoid. And we're going to add in the next trapezoid. So again, it has a height of 5. And we're going to multiply by uh, the two bases averaged together. So 15 plus 23 divided by 2. The next one is uh, 5 times 23 plus 32 divided by 2. Um, what is the area of the next one? Find, find the actual area yourself. Uh, I, um, what is the area of uh, this one is the one we're on? The fourth one. What is the area? Uh, hopefully you did 5 times 32 plus 30 divided by 2. And I, I hope you actually found it because I asked you to. Um, let's see. Um, 32 plus 30 divided by 2 times 5. So 155. If you're entering it into a calculator, you need to be careful you don't do something like this. Right? Like, this is wrong um, because of the order oper operations. The 32 and the 30 are both getting divided by 2. It needs to be in parentheses before it gets divided, um, and then it will give you the right answer of 155. Um, so the area of this trapezoid is 155. Um, you can also use the, if you're using this kind of calculator, you can make a fraction bar, and that makes it pretty easy to not mess up. 32 plus 30 divided by 2 times 5. That'll also work. Okay. Um, okay, we have two more trapezoids. We have plus 5 times, this is 30 plus 24 divided by 2, and there's one more, which is, I'll put it over here, 24 plus 27 divided by 2. Now, you may notice they all have a 5 with them, and so... Um, it's nice to factor out um, the 5. There's actually an even shorter shortcut um, to calculate this, which is that you'll notice that uh, the first one and the last one only happen once. But look at 15. 15 happens twice. 23 happens twice. 32 happens twice. Uh, 30 happens twice. All of the middle ones happen two times. And then this one and this one only happen one time when you're doing the trapezoid rule. So um, I want to show you like the shortest way to write it on your calculator is factor out the five. And then it's going to be like um, 
the first one divided by two, so eight divided by two, plus everything else won't get divided by two because it'll be like, so there's like, we, we can rearrange this. Oh no, hold on. My cut, my thing is telling me I have a low battery. Hopefully this is not messing up our video. Okay. Um, so um, you can think of this as like 15 halves plus 15 halves. And 15 halves plus 15 halves is 30 halves, which is just 15. Um, and the, the dividing by two and the multiplying by two, because there's two of them, will cancel out. And so you can just add them. 15 plus 23 plus 32 plus 30 plus 24. And then the last one, which was 27, this one needs to be 27 halves. So this is like, I don't know if you followed this or not. I, I'm sorry about that middle part. Um, this is the fastest way to calculate it. Um, it's 707.5. And so this is a, this is probably the best estimate. Now, uh, a, a cool fact is that, uh, if I didn't mess up the right, the left Riemann sum and the right Riemann sum averaged together should give me the trapezoid rule. It's not actually a faster thing to do, um, cause you're usually only calculating one of them. But if you happen to already have the left Riemann sum and the right Riemann sum, you can add them together divide by two and it'll give you the trapezoid rule. So again, the, tra the left Riemann sum, you make rectangles starting from the left, you don't end up using the right point. The right Riemann sum, you make rectangles starting from the right, you don't end up using the left point. The midpoint Riemann sum, you skip the first one, use the next one. Skip the next one, use the next one. Skip it, use it, and you'll always skip the last one. And the ones you use, you'll go both left and right and they'll make kind of a big rectangle that have a bigger, uh, make sure you're not messing up this um, this uh, this thing, the height of the rectangles or the width of the rectangles. And the trapezoid rule, you'll use every point and you'll add them together and divide by two and multiply by the base. Um, that's how the trapezoid rule works. So you'll get to try this all out. I, I will tell you the trapezoid rule is the most common one that shows up in the AP exam. The other ones are kind of equally split and the trapezoid rule is a little bit more common. Um, one other thing if a function is increasing, a left Riemann sum will be an underestimate because if you're increasing and you pick the points on the left, you'll always end up like missing a lot of area. So a left Riemann sum of an increasing function will be an underestimate, but a left Riemann sum of an over of a right re, a left Riemann sum of a decreasing function will be a, an overestimate. Um, it's backwards for a right Riemann sum. If you have a, an increasing function and you do a right Riemann sum, it will end up being an overestimate. You'll have like too much area. Um, so just something to like, if you just draw a picture of it, it'll always come out right if there's ever an, like is it an overestimate or underestimate thing? Okay, let's see. Um, so Juan is earning money at a rate of M of T dollars per day, okay? Um, we are going to estimate the area under the curve, which is the integral. We're finding this is like the integral of m of t. We're finding an estimate of it um, because it's the area under the curve by using the trapezoid rule with four subintervals. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to strongly recommend you draw a quick sketch and um, just like say, okay, it's zero, the x's are zero, 40, 70, 90. 100, and the y's are uh, 150, 180. Like, it doesn't need to be perfect, but you, you want to, like, have these, like, written out. It'll make it much more likely that you get it right. Um, so I strongly recommend it. Um, and we're using the trapezoid rule, so you're going to be connecting them and making a trapezoid. Connecting and making a trapezoid. Go ahead and try to calculate this on your own, see if you understood what we did in the previous problem, um, and we'll see how you do. And what you should have done is uh, for each trapezoid found the area and then added them up. This trapezoid has a height of 40 because 40 minus zero is 40. And the two bases are 150 and 180. So we're going to do 150 plus 180 divided by two. The next one will have a height of not 70. I hope you didn't put 70. 70 minus 40 is 30 times the two bases are 180 and 195 divided by 2. The next one has a height of 20 and two bases of uh, 195 and 184 
divided by two. You'll notice that uh, it's it helps you kind of like not mess up if you look. This should always ma match up with this. Um, and the last one is a height of 10. And uh, we've got 184 plus 172 divided by two. Um, let's go ahead and calculate this. I'm just going to type this in. 40. Uh, you're welcome to use a calculator on this stuff, guys. Uh, 150 plus 180 divided by 2. Uh, 30 times 180 plus 195 divided by 2. We've got 20 times... Uh, 185 plus 184 divided by 2, and finally 10 times 184 plus 172 divided by 2. Um, you'll notice that I couldn't factor out, like it's not multiplying by the same number each time here. So we got 17,795, okay? Um, but we weren't able to factor out the number here when we were putting in the calculator because it's not the same distance apart each time. If it's the same distance apart each time, which it often is, look, counting by the same amount each time, counting by the same amount each time, counting by the same amount each time, you can factor it out, but when it's a different amount, you cannot. Um, now, what does this mean? What does this 1775 mean? Well, this was how much money he was earning uh, at a rate of how many dollars per day. So this was over the course of 100 days this is adding up all the money he's making. This is not a rate anymore. So when we find the area, we're adding, we're accumulating all that money that he made. So he was making $150 per day, right? $180 per day. And we're estimating how much total money he made by finding that area. So if we have dollars per day and we do the integral, if we find the area, it's adding up those rates to find an amount, not a rate, okay? Okay. Um, oh, here we go. I guess that was the question to be. What does this value estimate? Um, it's how much money he made. So uh, Juan made $17,795 uh, over uh, between day zero and day 100. Um, this is the kind of, notice I used units here and units here, and I said um, when it went from and what it was. So we wanna be careful to when we're writing a sentence to include all those things, and I'll talk about that more later. A rock climber's altitude, that's how high he is, it's like his height, how high he is above sea level, is changing at a rate, um, F of T, in meters per minute. So this is how many meters per minute his altitude is changing. Um, Great, and we want to estimate the area under the curve using a left Riemann sum with six subintervals. Six number subintervals is just like um, how many pieces you're breaking it up into. This is one, two, uh, so can you guys see here? One, two, three, four, five. This was six subintervals. So was this and this. These were all six subintervals, and this one was only three subintervals. We only broke it up into three rectangles, so three sub intervals. Um, here we had one, two, three, four sub intervals. And, and they told us that there, that we're gonna do that. And here we're gonna be doing six sub intervals. So go ahead and try it on your own. Um, again, I really hope you started by putting like zero is 1.2. So we've got zero, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120. I strongly recommend just like a quick sketch of the data. So 1.2, um, 2.8, 1, 1.5, 2 uh, 4.0, 4.7, 5.1, 5.2, and the last one is 4.8. And I'm going to use the numbers from the table. Like I'm not going to rely on my handwriting. I don't want to have a copy error, um, but this will help me. Now, it's a left Riemann sum. So hopefully you started from the left. and You make a rectangle going straight over until you reach the next data point and down. So this is 1.2 times 20 plus. Drop a rectangle straight down and go over, drop it down. This is 
times 20. 4.0 times 20. 4.7 times 20. Uh, 5.1 times 20. 5.2 times 20. And hopefully you realize we do not need to use that last 4.8 because that is not part, when we start on the left, this is one, two, three, four, five, six subintervals. We'll never use the last point because our data is ending. Um, so let's do it. Uh, here I can factor out the 20 because it was all the same everywhere. So it's just gonna be 20 times, uh, I'm gonna just look at the table here to make sure I actually use the right ones. 1.2 plus 2 point, oh, that's 12. 1.2 plus 2.8 plus 4 plus 4.7 plus 5.1 plus 5.2. And I did not use the last one. This is 460. Um, on the AP exam, in the this comes up in the free response quite a bit. Uh, you need to show this adding and multiplying. Like this is what needs to be shown. You don't need to like factor out the 20 or whatever, but you need do need to show a sum of mult of sum of areas. Um, you, they will not grade your drawing. And you know what's awful is some years there'll be kids like when I'm grading these uh, on the AP exam, uh, there'll be kids who put like 20 times four. Like clearly they know that's the area of this and they do that for all of these and then they just write the answer here. Um, they need to explicitly show that they're adding a bunch of areas here. You can't just like write it in a picture. That doesn't do anything for you. Okay. So what does this 460 mean? Right. Fill in the sentence that I'm going to give you with what it means. This was how his altitude was changing in meters per minute. So this is the time is being measured in minutes. This is meters per minute. And so what is this 460? Well, uh, the rock climber, the rock climber's altitude increased, you guys can't see this, increased by 460 meters, not meters per minute, uh, during uh, T equals zero to T equals 120 minutes. I need to use this, uh, this unit and this unit. Um, this is the time period where his uh, height increased by 460 meters. So we'll be talking about this more again in a, a later lesson, but let's start getting familiar with like, hey, if you're like adding up rates, it's about how much something changed. Okay. Um, a rocket has a positive velocity launched upwards from an initial height of zero feet at a time zero seconds. The velocity of the rocket is given here. Okay, find the average acceleration of the rocket over the time interval from zero to 80. Include units of measure. So go ahead and try it. Hopefully you can get it. And hopefully we recognize that acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. It's asking for the average rate of change of the velocity. So this is y2 minus y1 uh, minus x2 over x2 minus x1. So we have 49 minus 5 over 80 minus 0. 44 over 80. Uh, we can divide these both by 4 and get 11 20ths. Or if you divide it, uh, I think this comes out to be 0.55. Seems right to me. Um, now, what are the units? What would acceleration be measured in? Velocity is being measured in feet per second. This will be feet per second squared. Feet per second per second. How many feet per second is it changing by each second? And on average, it's changing by 0.55 feet per second. Uh, over the course of 80 seconds, if you added 0 0.55, 0 0.55, 0 0.55, 0 0.55, 80 times, you would get to 49. And that's how much the velocity changed by. Okay, that was not this unit, but things get mixed together sometimes. You need to be able to do them all. Using a midpoint Riemann sum, so midpoint Riemann sum with three subintervals of equal length, approximate the area under the curve from 10 to 70. Be careful here. Then explain the meaning in terms of the rocket's flight. Go ahead and try this on your own. 
and hopefully we notice we should draw our data. So zero uh, was five, 10 was 14, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, okay, 14, 22, 29, 35, 40, 44, it's increasing, 47, and 49. Okay, cool. Looks something like this. And we are doing a midpoint Riemann sum, but be careful, it's not of the area under from 0 to 80. It was from 10 to 70. And that's where we're doing our midpoint Riemann sum set from. So this is our first data point in that range, and we're going to skip it and use this one. Skip it and use this one. Skip it and use this one. And then our last data point, which is at 70, will be skipped. So this will give me three rectangles. Remember, we go both right and left when we're doing our midpoint sum. It makes some very wide rectangles. But notice we're not like doing anything over here because it only said from 10 to 70. I think that was like honestly the trickiest part of this problem was that um, it was from 10 to 70 when the whole thing was from like 0 to 80. So we're uh, getting rid of like the ends here. We're going from 10 to 70. So let's see. Um, each of these rectangles has a width from 30 to 10 of 20. From 30 to 50, that's 20. From 50 to 70, that's 20. So it's going to be 20 times uh, 22 plus 35 plus 44. So, okay, let's see. It's uh, 30, 79, 99, 101. So 2020. Um, 2020, what? That's the midpoint Riemann sum. What does it mean for the rocket's flight? Well, this is how fast the rocket was going, how many feet per second it was going, uh, for how many seconds, right? And so this is feet per second times seconds, and the seconds will cancel out. This is how many feet the rocket went. So the rocket flew 2,020 uh, 2, feet from t equals 10, to t equals 70 seconds, okay? All right, last one, the rate. So again, we've got a rate. Um, calculus deals with a lot of rates. The rate that water is flowing out of a pipe in gallons per hour is given by a differentiable function, which just means that you could take the different derivative of it. The table shows the rate measured every four hours for a 24 hour period. Estimate the integral from 0 to 24 of r of t dt using a midpoint Riemann sum. So this is the area under the curve, and we want to estimate it. Again, I, I really hope you guys are starting by drawing out your um, area. Hopefully you were able to do it. Um, so 0, 4, yuck, 8, 12, 16, 20, 24. Uh, we want to use a midpoint Riemann sum with three subdivisions of equal length. Um, so we'll be doing that. And we're going from 0 to 24. Good. Okay, so 0 is 7.5. Uh, this is 9. This is 9.3. 9.5. A little bit lower. 8.8. 8.0. And 7.2. This is a midpoint Riemann sum. Uh, and we're going to skip the first one, use the second. Skip the next one, use the next one. Skip it, use it, and we'll always skip the end one um, if we did it right. So this is left and right. We go from here, we go both to the left and to the right. That way it is the midpoint of a rectangle. That's why it's called a midpoint sum. Um, and these all have a, a, a length of 8. 8 to 16 is 8. 16 to 24 is 8. And so we can factor out the 8 here and say it's going to be 8 times um, our heights were 9, 9.5, and 8. So this is, uh, what is this? 18.5, 26.5. So 26.5 times 8. What is that? That's 4 times 53. 
So 212. Okay, so 212. Um, 212 what? What does this represent? Well, this was the rate that water was flowing out of a pipe in gallons per hour. So this is gallons per hour times how many hours it was. And the hours will cancel out. This is um, 212 gallons of water flowed out of the pipe between t equals 0 and t equals 24 hours. We're just going to write the same sentence kind of every time. What was it? What were the units? What was the thing that was happening? And over what time interval, making sure we use the units here and here. That's Those are both required. All right, guys, that's it. You'll get some good practice on this. I will tell you that after getting some practice uh, on like the final exam and on the AP, like our practice AP exam and stuff, this is a topic that like a ton of people get right. Like with just a little bit of practice, um, the questions just aren't that hard. Like they don't get a lot harder than this. Uh, and, and so there's some really easy points to get on the AP exam, although they're kind of annoying calculations, I think. Um, but this is like some of the most commonly gotten points on our uh, practice AP exams. Um, it, like almost everybody gets these points, which is really good. So just practice it. Um, ask questions if you, you have them, but usually after a few example problems, um, you'll feel good about it. One thing to note is, um, before, we, before we go, is if a function is ever negative for some reason, uh, Riemann sum, sums still work. Like, you do a left Riemann sum, you know, and it will still measure, like, negative area, right? So it'll still work for negative numbers as well. Yeah. All right, guys. Um, I hope you have a good rest of your day and you're feeling okay about this Riemann sum stuff. Next class, we'll be talking about how to go away from an estimate and get an exact answer for functions when we don't just have a table. Um, and then we'll be able to find the exact answer for uh, Riemann sums and we'll be able to relate it back to integrals um, and find the exact value of those integrals. I hope you have a good day. Bye.